and now Awa. With the capture and control of the biggest remaining kingdoms of Ethiopian Empire, completed through peaceful infiltration of waves and Arab refugees over centuries, the triumphant Arabs were not disposed to follow the same long drawn out procedure in taking over the last Kiwi Kiyi kingdom of the formerly Black Empire. This was Awa. The Arabs decided on a full-scale war against the last citadel of black power in the southern Sudan. Although Makuria was almost was most in the spotlight of the wars against the Arab incursions, she was ably supported by Awa. Makuria had to carry the brunt of the burden because it was right next door to the enemy, and it alone had the awesome responsibility of holding the floodgates above the first cataract through which the Arab tides ebbed and flowed. Meanwhile, Awa, with ruins of the imperial cities of Napata and Moreau in his very midst, had a more direct responsibility for restoring and maintaining the glories of a black civilization that had refused to die with the fall of the Ethiopian Empire a thousand years before. Awa had replaced Moreau with its beautiful capital city of Soba, and had developed to its, its other towns and cities such an advanced lines that foreign writers could never fail to comment on the architectural designs. The wide streets lined with palm trees, the spacious homes, and in fact all things that they had observed in Mercuria, the thriving industrial crafts, large-scale cattle raising, a surplus producing agriculture that kept alive in the export trade and dates, wheat and gari, cotton fabrics and other produce, not only perishable and an efficient administration, a strong army headed by formidable cavalry regiments. Awa had made its defense system more secure by maintaining more walled towns and cities than Mercuria. These walled places were rebuilt primarily as centers of refuge against the constant Arab slave raids. Now they were to serve as freedom final bastions and defense against local enslavement. Awa was ready for whatever and what everyone knew was its last war as a nation. For the Arabs had formed a great confederation of its feuding tribes, these while perpetually at war among themselves, could always be counted on to unite quickly against non-Arab and non-Muslim people. Before the United Arab Armies entered Awa, the black leadership had ordered a general ex evacuation of the country by all women and children and the aged. The men, warriors all, remained to face the foe. It is not known whether the traditional black women's army corps existed in Awa. In any event, the Arabs did not find and indeed did not expect the conquest to be so easy. They knew all the courage of the blacks in battle and their unwillingness to surrender even when defeated. They had to take Alwa city by city, town by town, hill by hill, and bush by bush. The blacks were dying and fighting for the higher order of life they had built. They fought nobly on the plains of Alwa in 1504, while their people, some never to be seen again, joined other countless thousands in the Great Migration toward East, West, Central, and Southern Africa. the Surprise Kingdom. During the same period, these two black states were being destroyed. The history of the rebirth of destroyed African states was being repeated just beyond the borders by migrating Africans who had decided to make another stand in the midst of death and danger. These blacks were called the Funj people. They gathered in strength and with consummate daring, quickly formed a new nation and very, the very year all were passed from the scene as a state. Under the leadership of a strong king, general and statesman, Amara Dunquas, they established their capital at Senar on the Blue Nile and at the very outset of assumed an aggressive stance that put the world on notice that black power in Africa had not yet completely destroyed. That another fighting state had emerged and from ashes of those who had been destroyed. Indeed, the Foon state arose with such suddenness that the policies and programs so daring that it shocked both the Arabs and the now encroaching Ottoman Turks. The latter, after overthrowing Mameluke rule and taking over Egypt, quickly built and expanded defensive fortifications against possible Funj invasions. For these blacks that had turned tables of history by annexing and bringing under control of the Arab tribal states in lower Gezira region and their areas around the present Khartoum, the Funj king appointed an Arab as his general over Arab provinces, emphasizing the Arab status of tributary vassals by giving the office of governor an African title. All this proved to be just too much for the Western historians. Characteristically, and even today, they refer to the Funj as a mysterious people and wonder from whence they came. The debate with the usual air of deep scholarship, whether or not these blacks of the Funj kingdom were really blacks. When it is suggested that they were probably came from the East, it is the repeat of the overworked canard that plants the idea that all such people must have come from Asia. 
In his recent Modern History of the Sudan, P.M. Holt concludes that a rigorous investigation of the problem of foon organs origins has yet to be made. Why is there a problem, and what is the problem, if there is one? Both questions are integral parts of the great issue in this work. They have been rather fully answered in both con in different contexts. As to the particular case, therefore, the problem of Foon's origins is a problem for Caucasians only. Therefore, the problem of Foon's origins is a problem for Caucasians only, with the possible exception of those Negro scholars whose skewed vision of reality is through eyes of blue. People not concerned with the distortions of history, but desiring the truth about the past as honestly as it can be determined, will have no difficulty in understanding that the people who were called Foon's were on the uprooted of the countless groups who have been describing driven from one place and reorganizing to settle in another until uprooted again and again and resettling and rebuilding again and again on and on until the Europeans swept the whole continent and then afterwards. Some wandered into the utmost parts, as stated before, and some, like the Shilluks who built the Funj kingdom, did not leave their general region. If they came from the east, it was from the east bank of the Nile. In the interest of trade and foreign commerce, Funj kings, as many African kings were to do later, began to accept Islam and take the Arabic title of sultans. Thereafter, writers called the kingdom the Funj Sultanate. In this matter, the commercial activities that should be especially noted that in earlier times, the blacks equal the Semitic peoples and their interest and drive in the fields of finance, industry, and foreign trade. All over Africa, there were whole societies that were distinguished, enjoying fame for their skill and success in one of those business areas. That interest and drive in large-scale economic endeav endeavors were generally lost along the other institutions that had been the basis of their advanced culture. This was the major tragedy in the history of the blacks, and one about which they had not yet been fully awakened. Foonj or Shuluk traders roamed far and wide in the great game of buying and selling. The continued prosperity of the country depended largely on the selling activities in neighboring states. In Egypt, over all important caravan trade routes to distant lands, this trade was the forceful stimulus that kept the people at home, busy, and happy, producing the necessary surplus in agriculture, mining, and in the craft industry of various kinds. Having become Muslims, if only in name, the Funj merchants were readily received everywhere in the increasing Islama Islamicized world in Africa and Asia. The fact that they came from a proud and warlike state may have had more to do with the dif difference shown them than the fact that they were being Muslim. Non-Muslim Makuria and Alwa had a most flourishing trade with the Muslim world. The traders had been received with respect and honor by the Arabs. It is ironic that one has to be a fighter to command greater respect. Unlike Makuria and Alwa, the Funj kingdom did not resist Islamization. Islamization but welcomed it. Yes, yet its African nationalists clearly transcended Islam. The number of sultans and notables who rejected Arabic names is impressive and significant. Their open-door policies, however, were to speed up the pace of Arabization, not only in Funj Kingdom, but all the over the Sudan. And as Arabization spread among the blacks, so did slavery and slave raiding. The Arabs' insatiable and perpetual demand for slaves had long since changed slavery from an institution that signaled a military victory by the number of captured prisoners to an institution that provoked warfare expressly from the enslavement of men, women, and children for sale and resale. Human beings had now openly become very profitable articles of trade, and the slave dealers had found shorter routes to quicker riches. The Foons, like many other black states then, and since, found added wealth in the slave trade, and a new reason for waging war on their neighbors, for prisoners of war, to further the trade. Today it is difficult to find even a small region that does not have a history of intertribal conflict stemming directly from one group's raiding another for slaves, or attempting to either conquer another group, annex it, or enslave the whole society that was overrun. The Foons then, become just of another example of role played by the blacks that not only guaranteed their own damnation, but also made their unification for nationhood or anything else a most difficult undertaking. The difficulty became and becomes impossible for solution when as soon as the yoke of the white oppression had been removed, the descendants of former black oppressors comes forth as the rightful rulers as before just as though nothing at all had happened to change the overlord status of the proud slave-selling ancestors. The Foon's kingdom became 
and because of its Muslim shield and war-making machine, survived as a black state, in what otherwise would have been an impossible environment for 300 years. These centuries were characterized by all the ups and downs, internal power struggles, coups and counter coups that beset other states. Sometimes an Arab dynasty ruled, sometimes it was an Afro-Arab line, and at other times, and most often it was just a black dynasty, or what the Arabs called the Hamaji. The end came to the beginning of the 19th century when the Ottoman Turks began their reign of terror in the Sudan, and with the seizure of Senar by Muhammad Ali, the same Muhammad Ali who was the greatest murderer of blacks that ever set foot on the African continent. His massacre of men, women, and children was on such a scale that even the white world protested. The brief summary of the history of the three black states we have mentioned would be much longer than what we have said about Makuria, Awa, and Funj. Recounting the details of the history was not intended. Rather, the case study approaching it is being used as announced in the preview. Each of the states represents additional concrete documentation of the position I have taken. Often what might appear to be overly generalized declarations in each case, beginning with Egypt, the main focus was on significant data of the history of the black people and not on the great masses of equally interesting details. A few more states will be presented as further illustrations of all that is being said in connection with the history of African people. We started in the heartland of the race, whereas history, his, history clearly extended from the Sudan over Egypt. The antiquity of black civilization, the amazing heights it reached before recorded history, the early problems of Asian invasions, amalgamation, and new breed, the colored Egyptians, Caucasian penetration into royal black lineages, the increasing pressures on the blacks in their southward migrations, the Afro-Asian wars, the blackout of black history in Egypt, the long drawn out process of Caucasianization of Egypt as it was de-Africanized, and the withdrawal of Ethiopian borders to the first cataract, the concentration of blacks below that line, and the confusion of black history through the confusion of names, color, and dynasties, integration and amalgamation as brotherhood myths, the great black migrations, the splitting up of states and languages, and their role in the decline of black African civilization. All of these historical factors were set forth before the final collapse of the Ethiopian Empire in the 4th century AD. Before we begin the analysis of three children states that were born as the imperial mother passed, bequeathing to them her own deathless spirit to carry on. The main characteristics of the history of the blacks are reflected in these states. Building an advanced system of life, then having it destroyed. Building again, destruction again, migrating and building somewhere else, only to be sought out and destroyed again. Moving, 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 always moving, rebuilding and moving again and again. Countless thousands giving up the struggle as utterly hopeless. Internal strife increased as external pressures and threats to existence increased. And every man for himself philosophy replacing that of internal brotherhood in some societies. And through it all, new states forming even during the most destructive centuries when death seemed to be a rider on every stream and passing breeze. New states trying to restore yet, once again, their lost civilization, their written languages, their forgotten arts and sciences, the organization and study of their oral history that have come down unbroken in its main outlines for generation to generation, and a chance to remain in one area long enough to live again under African constitutional system that is unrivaled by that of any people. These efforts were still being pushed in every region of the African continent long after the undermining operation had been set in motion to pave the way for the conquest by Europe. The Africans were still rebuilding their own civilization when that of Asia and Europe was imposed.